Our next guest is going to teach us how to invest in real estate in San Diego. Please welcome Realtor from Century 21, Steve Pletz. Welcome back, Smarter San Diego. There he is, Steve Pletz. How are you, my friend? Hey, how's it going? How's it going? Good to be here. Well, excellent. Let's do something well, interesting. You want to talk about something interesting? I would love to talk about interesting. Let's, let's make it interesting. Let's go right into something interesting. You've talked a lot about real estate investing in the past. Tell me a little bit. What do we need to know? I have in the past. Right now, too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's fun stuff. It is. Especially if you have, um, you know, if you're not stupid. <laughs> and there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not Steve. You're wait, Steve. Wait a second. You're Steve. That's right. I'm Derek. Oh. We need to switch. All right. Hold on. It? Boom. Oh. There it is. All right. Good. Whew. Feels, yeah, it was weird. This, yeah. Sitting there. It feels better now. <laughs> <laughs> this feels right. So, <laughs> Steve, uh, Thank you for coming in today, first of all. Um, I think there's, I think now's a really hard time to invest in San Diego real estate. And I know you're a type of guy who will shoot us straight here. Um, but for, tell me how all the people out there who are even having trouble buying their own homes right. to live in um, can plot the course to potentially actually become an investor and own, you know, own real estate that they can rent out or flip right. or whatever. Yeah, and I, and I think that um, exactly as you've alluded to, the biggest challenge is that you're competing with owner-occupied buyers. You're competing with buyers that are purchasing for a roof over their head, and as we've talked about numerous times, people are buying that on how it makes them feel and emotion and all these things that are not price per square foot and that are not investment pieces. Um, so I think that as an investor, as, as in whether it's a first time or it's something that you've done many, many times, you need to be very strict about uh, your guidelines and very strict about what are the things that you're willing and unwilling to do. Um, and it may take more offers than you're comfortable with in order to actually crack into one. So how do you do it? A variety of different ways. Number one is you need to identify the correct types of sellers. Um, as we've talked about, there are sellers that price is very important, but it's not the most important thing. Um, trust sales where somebody has passed away and there's three different trustees that are all over the United States. They want to sell that property and they want to sell it at a, at a good price, but most importantly, they want to sell it. And so they want to be done with it. And so if you have the ability in order to say, look, I'm, I'm already been pre-approved, I can close this out, I can do short contingencies, I know what I'm looking for, I've already seen the property, I can waive some contingencies up front, not, not recommending that you do that, but all of those things will help get you a foot in the door. Um, so that's, that's a place to start. And then certainly from there is identifying the types of properties that you want, the types of tenants that you want, and make some decisions from there. So there's, which opens up a huge conversation, which is... Yeah, I mean, for, I mean well, first of all, just like right now, um, early 2017 in San Diego, prices have been going up for like five, six straight years. Right. So, I mean, as an investor, do you have to wait for the right time? Like, do you need to now be timing? Because we're talking about buying residential real estate, you know, for roof over your head, it really doesn't matter. You know, if you're going to live there for the long term, let's say 10 plus years, it doesn't matter. You don't have to look at the market. But as an investor now, do I have to pay attention to that? Do I have to look and go, ah, oh, well, the market's a little higher, now maybe I should wait? Or how well, do you navigate that element of the now? Well, and, and so I can only speak from my own personal experience, which is the investing that my wife and I have done, is we look for two main criteria. One is appreciation, and the other is cash flow. If it only has one of those criteria, we're not interested. Gotcha. If, if if I'm making $100 a month, but overall in the long term this doesn't become a good investment, I'm not interested. If I'm losing $250 per month on it, it's not a good investment in my opinion. And so what we look for is a 6% return. If I invest $100,000, I want to make $6,000 that year. Because otherwise, there's, uh, most people have a mortgage, and that mortgage comes with an interest rate. So that interest rate for us is around 4%. If I'm not getting 4%, I might as well put that money in my mortgage and pay down my principal because there I'm getting that return on that money. Um, so, so the short answer is um, I don't think that there is specifically an ability to time the market, but I do think that you can do what you can on the front end to protect yourself and make sure that you're walking into some equity. It may not be as big as it has been in the past, um, but multiple offer situations are at least helpful to know 
there's other people that are interested in this property, so if I want out and beat them out by $5,000, maybe they would be willing to come up in another month or two. And then the, the big thing to me is the cash flow. F crunching the numbers and figuring out not only principal interest taxes insurance, but HOAs, vacancies. How long is the property going to sit vacant and what does that cost me as the investor? Um, what do I need to fix up? It, how much is that going to cost me? So that you look at it from a dollar and cents kind of situation, whereas the average typical homeowner that buys a house, they look at their monthly payment. And then they're surprised by supplemental tax bill. They're surprised by um, the work that needs to go into the property, those types yeah. of things. And that screws up all your numbers. Yeah, you have to, now when you're saying 6%, are you saying including all, like maintenance everything. costs and everything? Vacancies, mm -hmm. everything. That's everything. what I want. And so certainly, and that's, um, that's optimistic, especially in this marketplace where we're talking about every, probably every realtor you've had on here is talking about multiple offers, very limited inventory, blah, blah, blah. It does make it more challenging. So um, it, it, it has to pencil. Because if it doesn't pencil, it doesn't make sense in any way, shape, or form to all of a sudden jump into a market that is hot with the expectation that, hey, I'll ride it out. I don't care if I'm losing money every month. In the end, that's going to be a great investment, and I'll be able to sell it in, in a couple years. That's a bad way to jump in. So you need income and appreciation to I need, feel yes. good about it. What about vacation renting? I mean, is that the t property type that people should be looking for? Because that would consider, be considered to be income. Side. Correct. Yeah, like VRBO mm -hmm. or Airbnb. Um, the, I think there's, there's some challenges with that. Typically, those types of properties need to be in specific neighborhoods. Um, if I live in Kansas, and I'm coming to San Diego, I'm probably, I love, I live in Vista, I love Vista, I'm probably not coming to live in Vista. If I'm gonna come out here for a week, I wanna go to all the coastal communities. Mm. I wanna go to Carlsbad, Encinitas, Del Mar, Solana Beach, La Jolla, downtown, all of those places where there's stuff going on. And those price points get, uh, have become extremely competitive mm. and have, and could make an argument for some of those price points are a little overinflated. So it, so is it a good investment? Maybe. Um, I think it's a case-by-case -case situation. But when you look at those neighborhoods overall, they don't pencil. So maybe more risk or potentially more reward. Potentially, yes. If things continue to go the way they have. And, and so here's, here's my big thought of it. If you're buying an investment and you need to say that, if things continue to go the way they're going, it's a bad investment. <laughs> you don't want that. Yeah, you need it to be safer than that. You want to be something that you step into today and you say, hey, look, I don't know what's going to happen to the market. However, here's what I do know. I'm walking into equity some today. I'm walking into cash flow today. These things I can control. Mm -hmm. So if you're not walking into that and you're hoping if everything continues, if, if this market continues, then you're not a savvy investor. Then anybody can become an investor. Just buy a house. Yeah. Well, I think that one of the things that's turned me off uh, on the vacation rental side of things is just that I feel like a lot of these properties that are vacation rentable are have it already priced in. It's already priced in that they're going to have you know more income, and so then you go and you you're buying a place based on that, but you're not really getting that equity. That that seller is getting that equity from you. You're right. having to pay for that equity, and now if you lose that for some reason, heaven forbid, citywide rule changes or like in Del Mar they outlawed it basically. Right. Um, then all of a sudden you just lost big time. So setting yourself up for less of that, more upside, right? That's what you're talking about. You want to set yourself up for more upside. Like I don't want to have to say, oh, well, if this happens, then it's a good investment. No, you want to set yourself up for this a lot of upside. So in a tight market like this then, how do I approach this? I mean, is it, just, is it literally just a numbers game where I'm going to have to say, okay, hey, you know, Steve, I've saved up some money. Um, I already own my own home. I want to invest in more real estate. Uh, do I just need to be in, like, do I have to write 100 offers? Do I have to stare at the real estate market every day? Like, how do I get ahead yeah. in such a competitive situation? Well, and I think that you can work backwards a little bit and you can figure out probably what you're going to want to do is start small. You're going to start want to start with a, <coughs> excuse me, a one bedroom, a two bedroom, maybe a condo, maybe something that's more affordable in a, in a, in a lower price point, and recognize what are the demographics that you're going to rent to. Um, if you're, 
if you're near the military base, potentially you've got military clientele. If you're in a smaller place, maybe that's a young professional. If you've got a two bedroom, one or two bedroom, you're probably not renting to a family. And so understanding the demographics as well and the advantages and disadvantages of each de demographic. Students are great in that mom and dad oftentimes co-sign, but the downside is they only want to be there for nine months. Usually they don't want to have a rental where they're there June, July, and August because they're out of school and they'd rather go home or do other things. Um, so identifying who the demographic is as well will also help you work backwards. So then you can figure out, okay, I've got a one or two bedroom. Who likely would this property rent to and what can I command and rent and then work the other way. Okay, I got it. So you, you kind of have to start with, begin with the end in mind essentially. Begin with the end in mind. Okay, fantastic stuff, great advice. Is there a, any other advice that you would have for potentially a, a new investor out there who's getting cracking right now? Well, I, I think that it's, it's worth it to, to take a look at it because as, as an investment class, I mean, all we hear about in the financial world, world is d diversify your portfolio and, hey, don't be entirely in residential real estate, don't be entirely in mutual funds, don't be entirely in all these different places. It, what I love about it is it's a great diversification um, to have potentially to, through the equity proposition where I'm paying myself the equity over time because I'm leveraging and I'm putting 25% down and getting and using all that equity. I think all of that is, is really helpful. Here's what I mean. I didn't explain that very well, so let me describe it. <laughs> Let's use $100,000 just because that's a round number. You certainly wouldn't need $100,000 to invest in into real estate, but that's a great way to, st to start. If I have $100,000 and I want to buy in the stock market and I discover I want to buy UPS, um, and it's trading at $100 a share, I can buy 1,000 shares of UPS. Or if I buy in residential real estate because of leveraging, I can take $100,000 and I can put 25% down and now I'm buying a $400,000 house. So in both situations, if the market jumps 10%, my UPS shares have gone from $100 a share to $110 a share and I make $10,000, where my $400,000 house goes to $440,000. Same appreciation amount, however, it impacts me greater because I'm able to leverage. And so that's the benefit, in my opinion, of residential real estate, or all real estate, um, is l the ability to leverage. Great stuff, Steve. Thank you so much for your time today. Really hey, appreciate thank you, it. Steve, or Derek. <laughs> <laughs> Stick around for more Smarter San Diego TV, where we're guaranteed to make you smarter than everyone else, commercial free.